Good morning, gentlemen and guests. Uh, welcome to the 33rd annual H.K. Douglas Cotton Memorial Lecture. Now, back in 1979, Gilman had the great fortune to receive a very generous gift for the creation of an endowment fund to establish an annual lecture on uh, career planning. And it was the wish of the donor, H.K. Douglas Cotton, to, quote, uh, instill in our students a better understanding and a keener interest in the world of business and economics, end quote. And this stipulation has been uh, interpreted to include all the leading professions from law and the sciences to business and industry. Now, although Mr. Cotton never attended Gilman himself, he developed an association with the school while his seven grandsons were students here in the 70s and 80s. And he currently has uh, th uh, great grandsons, I believe it's three, uh, who are attending Gilman and are in the upper school as well. We are extremely grateful to the Cotton family for their continued support and interest in this uh, lecture series. And I especially would like to welcome the members of the Swindell family who are here today uh, to listen to us. Please give them a round of applause. Now, once, uh, once our speakers have finished their presentations, they're going to open the floor for questions for as long as time will last. So uh, get ready for that. Now, our first speaker is Dr. Andrew Cameron, a 1987 graduate of Gilman and the winner of the Fisher Medallion, the highest award which the school can bestow. Now, currently, Dr. Cameron is the surgical director of liver Transpl transplantation and an associate professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He ex his expertise ranges from diseases of the liver and pancreas to abdominal and general surgeries. Dr. Cameron was a 1991 Harvard graduate and earned both an MD and PhD from Johns Hopkins. He did his surgical res residency at Massachusetts General Hospital and completed a fellowship in liver, liver transplant surgery at the Dumont UCLA Liver Cancer Center in LA. He has been honored by Johns Hopkins with the William Stewart Halstead Award for Outstanding Performance in Surgery and by Harvard Medical School with its Excellence in Teaching Award. In addition to his surgical career, Dr. Cameron runs a laboratory uh, studying stem, cell and the development, stem cells and the development of drugs to prevent recurrence after liver transplants. His lab is also examining the use of social media to increase the rate of organ donations. Dr. Cameron is the second member of his family to work as a surgeon at Hopkins. His father, John, was the hospital's chief of surgery from 1984 to 2003, and he assisted his father in co-authoring the 10th edition of Current Surgical Ther Therapy, known worldwide as a trusted resource for advice on the selection and implementation of the latest surgical approaches. Gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Cameron, Andrew Cameron. Well, good morning. Thanks to the Swindells, the Cottons, and uh, thank you, Mr. Schmick, for that introduction, some of which was true. My name is Andrew Cameron. That part is true. And I am a transplant surgeon down at Johns Hopkins, and I graduated from Gilman in 1987, uh, which was, by my math, about 100 years ago. Um, it was different back then. No Ravens, no Harbor East, no cell phones, no email. I got taught science by Gus Lewis and Steve Sawinski, who I gather is still around. I got my history from Jerry Thornberry and Shanti Kumar. Okay. I got some Latin from Mr. Vicio, and I got Shakespeare from Mr. Holly, if you can believe that. Oh, he's got, he's, got, he's got a lot of different skills. Shakespeare's one of them. Singing the Penn Fight Song was another one, as I recall. Our football team that year beat McDonough 8-7, and that was a team that Peter Quitterovich was the spiritual leader of. He was a, sort of a young, less angry Ray Lewis, as I recall. And he was my best friend. And uh, little Brooks Matthews led the lacrosse team. And we called the gym the Deaf Dome on Friday night, as I recall, for Friday night basketball games. And Coach Jose Duncan would give us this little whistle when we were supposed to run faster than we already were. And uh, you know you know who had it better than us in 1987? Nobody. <laughs> so I guess some of that stuff hasn't really changed. And uh, Mr. Finney was the headmaster. And he taught us by example the difference between right and wrong. And his voice is kind of still in my head when I need some direction, which is almost daily, it turns out. So let me tell you about what I do for a living. I'm a doctor at Hopkins. I do liver transplants. 
So here's the deal with that. Your liver sits right up here. Its job as an organ is to filter your blood from any toxins you might come across and to make the proteins your body needs. Now, if you were to drink too much alcohol, for example, for a very long time, or if you were to get a hepatitis C viral infection, your liver can go bad and you get very, very sick. You turn yellow, you start vomiting blood, you kind of lose your mind with confusion. You get medievally sick and then you die. There's no drug that can help you at that point. There's no liver dialysis machine. You just die. This can be little kids who were born with congenital liver disease. It can be young people like you that develop autoimmune disease. It can be people that got hep C from a blood transfusion during a minor surgery. But still, no matter who you are, how you got your liver problem, you just die. So think about that. Could be you, could be a member of your family. I've got an eight-year-old daughter who I live and breathe for. If she got sick like that, she would just die. Unless, unless someone else, a total stranger, decided to save her life. That stranger, who you will never know, has said, when I die, I want to donate my organs. So down at Hopkins, I get a call that there's an organ donor in some hospital. It might be in West Virginia. It might be in New Jersey. It might be all the way down in Florida. We hop into a helicopter or a Learjet. We fly to the hospital as quick as we can, take the organs out of the dead person as careful as we can, bring them back to Hopkins, and often at the last possible moment, put them into a very, very sick person. And then when we're done, up all night, tired beyond belief, we walk out of the operating room and we tell the family, your kid is not going to die after all. She's going to live. So that's what I do every day. And it shocks me that they pay me. And you can do it too. If you're interested, so here's what you got to do. And here's more importantly what you don't have to do. You don't have to be a math science nerd. Not that there's anything wrong with that which is kind of what I was, but you just have to want to help people, okay? You go off to college, which is so much fun, you can't believe. In fact, I wish I was you going again, so please do enjoy yourself when you go to college. Anyway, at college, you take the minimum pre-med classes, a little chemistry, a little biology, it won't hurt too much, plenty of time to study whatever else you want, play sports if you want, have a good time. Then you go to medical school for four years, which is also a blast, believe it or not. Lots of nice people, you meet, you learn lots of interesting stuff. Then boom, you're a doctor. Your mom is very psyched, telling everyone she knows. My son, the doctor, you'll see. And then you do training in surgery, specializing in transplant, eight more years. Sounds like a long time, but it is really this journey that is more than half the fun. And you're ready to roll, you know, let the miracles begin. If we're supposed to be talking about and helping you decide what you want to be when you grow up, here's what I can tell you is the good part about being a doctor. You get to work with your hands. You really do something instead of just talking, which is, is very cool. You also have to work with your brain. You have to figure things out, be clever. So it, it sort of never gets boring. But most of all, you get to help people you need. You save the lives of strangers. You get paid a little bit, but mostly you go to bed happy every night. So that's all I'm really offering you, but it's everything. You may think you couldn't do this, but you can. Um, I, I sat in that seat back there. People will help you do it. So if you want it, come and get it. All right, I've got three minutes left, and I want, there's one more very important thing I want to tell you. You ready? It, it, it's this. Forget everything I just told you. So anybody who's not really listening right now, you're, you're in great shape. You actually didn't need to hear any of that stuff. First time you've been told that, maybe. So I don't care, actually, if you become a doctor. You, you don't really have to be a transplant surgeon like me, it turns out. I think there's only one thing that really matters, and it goes back to what Gilman taught me, and I still think about it 25 years later. So two quick final stories about Gilman to make the point. The first is from Mr. Finney, okay? So I don't know if you still get told about first, second, and third class citizens. 
Okay, if you somehow haven't heard that, let me tell you the story about littering that Mr. Finney used to tell us. Turns out there are three types of people in the world, okay? There are third class citizens who litter, okay? They drop trash on the ground, it's terrible, it makes the place worse for everybody. They're just lame. There are also second class citizens, okay? Now they don't litter, which is good, but if they uh, walk by a piece of trash on the ground, they just keep going, okay? They don't pick it up, that's okay, but it's still kind of lame. Maybe not as bad. And then there are first class citizens. They don't litter, but also if they see trash on the ground, they stop and they pick it up and they throw it away. It's not their trash, they didn't do it. Nobody's watching them, but they pick it up. So for years, I thought this story was about keeping Gilman clean. And that is because I am occasionally a little slow, but somewhere along the line, it came to me that what Mr. Finney and Gilman were trying to ask me was what kind of person I was gonna be. The kind that only looked out for myself or went through life kind of neutral, not really caring much about the other guy, or would I try to be the kind of person that left the world somehow better than he found it? So I don't, I don't care if you, if you go on to be a doctor or a lawyer or a hedge fund guy or, or whatever. It, it doesn't matter if you work in a deli, play second base, whatever. It's your life, not mine. We all kind of have to find our own way. But I do think it's important that whatever you do, you give, you serve, you help, you leave it a little better than the way you found it. And you do that in any way you see fit. So last story. I graduated from Gilman in June of 1987. And one of my favorite teachers, who I guess is no longer around, maybe on the track team, Mr. Julius, Peter Julius, went out to dinner. I sort of was going to say adios. I was heading off to college. He'd been my track coach then, way back then. And I thanked him for all he'd done for me, and I told him how grateful I was for him and for Gilman and all that. And he wrote me this letter, which I still have. And I'm going to read you a line from it um, to show you what Gilman taught me to prepare me for life and for choosing a career. And he's talking to me in this letter, obviously, but he's talking to you too. So, you know, here it is. So on June 4th, 1987, he writes, thank you for the dinner, blah, blah, blah. Here's what he says. You know me well enough, I think, to understand it's not just a routine for me to duck any credit for what you have become. This is for you. You are self-made. No one else decided for you to forgo the easy way to spend your nights in the books instead of bed to suck it up in the last lap or the third period I wrestled to. Take the credit yourself, but to whatever extent you credit Gilman for your success, remember that you are one of a very lucky few. You were the beneficiary of a fundamental inequity, an inequity that I hope you will do what you can to reduce rather than perpetuate. So listen, you go to Gilman. That's very special. I am incredibly proud of the fact that I went there. I got the tie on today and I'm psyched. Never be embarrassed or ashamed of it. You don't have to apologize for it. It's special. The teachers, the teams, the tradition, the pride. You know who's got it better than you right here, right now? Absolutely nobody. But now I work in East Baltimore. I sometimes teach at Dunbar High, right next to Hopkins, and the facilities aren't really as nice as Gilman. I trained in California and did organ procurements in South Central Los Angeles and tough neighborhoods. There are people there that don't have Gilman. They don't have what we have. My challenge to you, last bit, is the same one I was given 25 years ago. What will you do with your life? Surgeon, banker, musician, teacher, I don't really care. It doesn't actually matter as much. What, what matters is the kind of person you're going to be. Will you give back and make the unfortunate differences that exist in this world less rather than more? Will you help those who are sick or in need? Will you help when called? Will you leave the world somehow in some way better than you found it. If you do that in your own way, then Gilman has taught you well, and we can continue to be very proud to be Greyhounds. Thanks very much.